Acts chapter 10. Now I will tell you that the Lord led me to this passage. Uh, he led me to this passage uh, um, several days ago. And I, I did not realize it has an application to uh, uh, Memorial Day. We'll just read the first verse and then you can be seated. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. You may be seated. If you guys could turn me down just a little bit in the monitor up here, the house monitor. I want to speak to you this morning on a subject I've entitled, The Journey of Cornelius. This is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible to read because it so profoundly uh, declares the intentions of the Lord Jesus Christ with regard to the gospel. I, I would to God, um, I'm looking for, a, uh, looking for a magic potion or some magic words or, or something that would eliminate. And I, I, pray, I pray to God today that you see in the, in the scriptures that uh, the Lord, I would love to be able to completely eliminate the sense of entitlement that many church folks feel today. Whether it be in this church or any other church, we, we somehow feel like uh, that, that we made this all up, that we founded it, that we're the ones that God gave it to and that we're the most special people on the face of the earth as, with regard to, our, our, to what we have and what we know. And the truth of the matter is, but for the grace of God, but for the grace of God, you could be in the lowest place you've ever heard of. And for some of you, that's, that's pretty low. It's the grace of God that gives us everything that we have today. It's not what your name is, not who your mama is or who your daddy is or how much money you got in your pocket or the bank that gives you the opportunity for salvation. It's the grace of God. Caesarea, approximately 45 miles from Jerusalem. I was all around it while I was over there a couple of months ago. 45 miles from Jerusalem and 30 miles from Joppa. That's where I ate my last supper the night before that I left, before we flew out, was from the city of Joppa, where Peter was connected with Cornelius. And in the, in the time of Jesus Christ, it was a relatively new city. It had only been in existence for 60 or 70 years. And there was a great harbor that was built there. And Herod desired it to be the port of his capital. And the headquarters for the Roman forces were all located here. And it was the residence of Philip the Evangelist with the prophesying daughters you'll read about, as well as the place where Paul was in prison for two years. And it's also the place where he preached to Agrippa when a Agrippa declared those famous words, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He was a centurion, which is a commander of a hundred soldiers in the Roman army. Now I want to point your attention very close to verse number 2. Verse number 2 says, describing Cornelius, says he was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. Let's talk about Cornelius' attributes. He was devout. That word devout is defined as a reverence. Exhibited. And when it says exhibited, means you can see it. It's not just on the inside. And I'm glad to tell you, you get a relationship with the God of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You cannot keep it on the inside. He was devout. Reverence exhibited, especially in actions, are sacred awe, amazement. It comes from the Greek word Eusebius, which directs us to the energy which, directed by that holy awe of God, we find expression in devoted activity. It means that those prayers and giving and all was, was a response to being led by God. Can, can I tell you that the Lord's going to lead you to the right place and it's not to a place of less consecration or less commitment or less church or, or less Bible reading or less prayer. When the Lord begins to lead you, He's going to lead you to the land of more. Amen. 
Ah. Oh, well, you may not have more money and you may not have a bigger house and a bigger car, but with the closer you get to the Lord, the less those things matter in the first place. So he's going to lead you to the place of more. He continually described the promised land as a, as a place that flowed with milk and honey. And we've heard the story of what the spies brought back of, of the fruit, of the abundance of it. Everything the Lord promises is true and it's just how He wants you to have it. And if you're, God have mercy. If you're settling for anything less, uh, you're falling short of what God has for you. And again, we're not talking about dollars and cents. We're talking about contentment and fulfillment in the will of God. Amen. Cornelius was a good fellow. Devout. Feared God with all his house. Fearing God is an individual thing. You may tell your children or you may tell somebody, you know the Lord's watching you and then they're going to be scared the rest of the night. That's not the fear of God. The fear of God is something that we have inside of us and it gets in our mind and our spirit and our heart wherewith it is expressed in a, a, a unquenchable desire to be pleasing to Him. It's a respect thing. And the fact that His house is referred to suggests that Cornelius has spent time sharing whatever exposure to God he had with his house. He feared the Lord with all his house. And as I read that, I thought we need a revival of that in our homes. <laughs> well, I'm going to do some good preaching this morning. Y'all better hold on. And when, it, when the Lord allows me to preach good, it always, one of the two things happen. You love me or hate me. Huh? We got to get the Lord back into our homes. And boy, I'm about to get into trouble probably. But you let Hannah Montana into your house, and now she's turned into Miley Cyrus, and where are you? That's right. Come on. Come on. That's about how I feel like being right now. We, we have got to take back control of our homes and then give it to the Lord. Amen. He feared God with all of his house. He feared God with all of his house. This church is not your children's playroom. Okay? Teach them to reverence the house of God. Teach them to reverence the Spirit of God. And it begins at your house. You can't expect to show up here and all of a sudden they magically start doing right. you got to do it at the house so it happens in this house. And it all begins with the fear of God. I'm going to say this again. It ain't the fear of the pastor. It's the fear of the Lord. Don't make me be the bad guy. I want to keep giving your kids mints and hugs and lovings and stuff. I don't want them to think I'm mean. Can I get an amen up in here? He feared God with all of his house. And he gave much alms to the people. That's self-explanatory. And he prayed to God always. Kept a regimented, regular prayer life. Can I get an amen? amen? Thank you. Rome, Romans were a polytheistic people, meaning they believed in many different gods, worshipped many gods, similar to the Greeks. They just had different names for their gods and they were very, very philosophical, meaning that they elevated the thinking. The, the, you remember in, in uh, the different places in the Bible where it just, just if, if you come up with some new idea, then, then you, you're considered elevated in society. And apparently Cornelius has been exposed to the true God to the point where he has become a seeker of God and he prays to God always and he has allowed his exposure and his, uh, his experience with God to determine how he lives his life. He has allowed his exposure to God to determine how he lives his life. How is it that a heathen pagan who worships the sun and the moon and the stars and the water and the goddess of fertility and the goddess of, of wine and, and uh, having a good time and, and, and who they founded the, the whole idea of, of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, all of a sudden he, they have conquered this people. He is in authority over this people. But something has happened, Brother McKinney, to his relationship with God as a virtue of a people that are supposed to be defeated. 
You understand what I'm saying? The Romans come in and defeat the Jews. They take over where they live. They set up themselves as king and themselves as authority. But Cornelius, who is a man under authority and who is a man that's over people, he has decided to worship the God of those who are servants to him. Verse number 3, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, this ain't never happened to me. And I have to be perfectly honest with you today. I, I mean, the right thing is to say, oh, I'd love to have an angel come down. But i got to tell you the truth, I ain't no know if I want to or not. <laughs> I'd be scared to death. He called him by name. Cornelius is fasting and praying at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And in a vision from God, an angel comes to visit him. Intentionally and specifically because he called him by name. And you've got to grasp a hold of all the nuances of, of truth that are revealed in Acts chapter number 10. And somebody should be super excited when they recognize and realize the Lord knows me by name. Amen. Not just as a figure, not just as a, a one of many people, but when that, vo that sound of many waters begins to rise up, the Lord can hear my voice in the middle of a hundred thousand people. Yeah. Verse 4, when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial. Now that was an accident. I didn't intend to teach this message because of Memorial Day, but the Lord knows what he's doing. Amen. Come on. Have come up for a memorial before God. Basically, you got the Lord's attention. You've got the Lord's attention. Now the reason for Cornelius being chosen had nothing to do with him being a Gentile altogether. Except for the necessity of a particular individual through whom the will of God could be manifested. Up until this time, the only people that had been filled with the Holy Ghost were Jews and Samaritans or Gentiles who had converted to Judaism by being circumcised and observing the tenets of the law. There was nobody who was a heathen Gentile who had been filled with the Holy Ghost, at least as recorded by the Bible. There was an agenda. The Lord was wanting to reach out, launch out into all the world. There was a plan. There was an agenda. But it was Cornelius that he chose to do that through, not because uh, of he needed to shine a light from heaven down like he did with Paul, or, or not because he was just pulling a random name out, but he found somebody who was hungry for God. Amen. And how do you know you're hungry for God? You seek after Him. And... He was qualified as a candidate for a monumental work to be done through him. He sent him a directive. He said, go to Joppa and ask for a man named Simon whose surname is Peter. He's staying with a man also named Simon. The tanner whose house is by the seaside. And every time I read this stuff, it is just so cool to me that, that I ate supper by the seaside. <laughs> I saw those same waves lapping up against the, the shore. He'll tell you. Now listen. He will tell you what you ought to do. Does anybody, is, has anybody picked up yet? I described to you Cornelius. Okay, I described him to you. There is a one word question that continually reverberates in our minds when we read about Cornelius, who was a devout man, feared God with all of his household, prayed to God always, and gave away a whole bunch of money to the poor. But an angel came down and said, you got to go to Joppa. And there's a fellow over there by the name of Peter, Simon Peter, who's staying with Simon the Tanner in a house by the seaside. You get him to come to your house and he'll tell you what you ought to do. Thank you, Brother Billy. I hope everybody's grasping that. He was devout. 
which exhibited itself in actions. He prayed to God always. He gave much alms to the poor and feared God with all of his house. But an angel came down and said, you need to go find the preacher named Peter. And he'll tell you what you ought to do. Now you got to grasp a hold just a minute here. What, what arises up in your mind? Because, now listen to me. I pastor you folks. And in addition to the, folk, the things that you let me know about you, there are also things that the Lord shows me in prayer about you. Amen. Amen. Thank you Lord. It happens. Amen. Now don't get scared and don't quit coming to church on account of it. Amen. We got folks right here that don't pray to God always. Don't give much to the poor. Don't fear God with all their household. It's just, we'll just well be truthful. Huh? Don't mean you're dying and going to hell. It means you've you got, got, some, got some growing to do. I'm fixing to hit on that in just a minute. So the question that we have to ask ourselves... He was devout, meaning that his actions represented his awe for God. He prayed all the time, gave much alms to the poor, feared God with all of his house. And an angel comes down and says, go find that preacher named Peter and he'll tell you what you ought to do. And the question I had to ask myself, why? You would think... Based upon the descriptions that's given and the, and the perception that so many people have of what a Christian is, that the angel would have come down and said, Good boy. Right. See what I'm saying? You think that the, that the Lord would be sending an angel down there, you go fix a meal or something for Cornelius, and you pat him on top of the head, and, and you know, maybe he gets a new suit of clothes or something, or, or maybe there's, you know, somebody comes by and gives him a new donkey, or, or some, kind of, some kind of blessing, whatever a blessing would have been to Cornelius. You think that all the good he had done would have caused the Lord to want to come down and, and reward him for it. Instead, he comes down and says... You got to go find a preacher named Peter, and he's going to tell you what you ought to do. Now, there's two responses that can rise up there. We know the natural response. The Bible doesn't elaborate a whole lot. It just tells us what Cornelius did. But I, we have. I, I was even thinking this morning of of a, of, a, of a simple small criticism that probably need to be offered to an individual, and and automatically I have to run it through the filter of how they're going to react. Huh? Cornelius is doing good, man. He's working hard. He's doing a good job. He's fearing the Lord. And he's a Roman and don't have to. He's serving God because he wants to. He's doing good enough. Hear me right now. He is doing good enough in his walk with God that he prayed an angel down from heaven. How much giving? sends two of his servants and a soldier three from those that served under him told them exactly what they were doing sent them to Joppa and the next day the three approached Joppa
Now I'm going to summarize verses 9 through 16 because I want to get good, get to the good part. But Peter goes to the rooftop to pray around the sixth hour of the day, which is noon. The Jewish day, this is just something you might remember, the Jewish day begins at six in the morning and ends at six at night. At 6.01, like 6.01 tonight is Monday for them. Y'all get that? That's why something that happens at 7 o'clock tonight, they'll say it happened on Monday. When they start Sabbath, it is from Friday evening at 6 until Saturday evening at 6. And around the 6th hour, 12 o'clock noon, Peter goes to the rooftop to pray. Now i got to add this one little caveat in here. Do you notice that there are things that happen when people pray regularly? First thing is Cornelius is in prayer and an angel comes down. And Peter is in prayer and you're about to see what happens to him because while he was praying, he got very hungry. And then he fell into a trance, the Bible says, which is simply a place where one is sensitive only to God. The heavens opened up and a, and a certain vessel came to him. It looked like a great sheet that had been knit together and uh, at the four corners and let down to earth. And in this sheet were all manner of four-footed beasts and, and of the fowls of the air and wild beasts and creeping things. And a voice spoke to Peter and said, Rise, kill, and eat. Now I don't have the time to go into the dietary laws of the Jews, but everything that was in that sheet was things that Peter wasn't allowed to eat. Okay, they had very strict dietary laws. And Peter said, I want you to notice something here. When an angel came down to Cornelius, he said, what is it, Lord? When the voice of the Lord spoke to Peter and told him to do something, he responded with no. There's some powerful ministry that's going on in this chapter right here. Some powerful ministry. Cornelius, who has no right, who has no place in the kingdom of God, hears an angel speak to him, and his response is, What is it, Lord? Peter, who's given the keys of the kingdom, preaches the message on the day of Pentecost. His Holy Ghost filled, baptized in Jesus' name. The Spirit of the Lord speaks to him and says, Rise, kill, and eat. And he says, Not so, Lord. For nothing common or unclean has ever entered into my lips. Then the voice spake again and said, What God hath... <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, this ought to make somebody happy. What God hath cleansed, Amen. that call not thou common or unclean. Amen. This happened three times, and then it was received back up into heaven. Now the Bible says, while Peter doubted as to what this vision meant, the men from Cornelius stood and inquired at the gate of Simon's house. They're knocking on the door to see if it's the right place. The scripture then repeats Peter's quandary. He doesn't understand the vision. But the Spirit speaks to him and said, there's three fellows at the door. I've sent them to you. Don't doubt what they're saying and go with them. Then Peter went down and revealed himself to them as the one they were looking for. And he said, what are you here for? Now the messengers began to share with Peter their purpose for him. Their purpose for coming to him. Acts 10 and 22. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of a good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Why is this so important? Why is it so important that they, the angel says it? Cornelius sends his servants and, and they repeat it to Peter. Because the Bible says in Romans 10 and 17 that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Now the diminished emphasis upon the word that much of the religious world has migrated to is a sign of peril. It's a sign of problem. 
Because a famine of hearing the Word leads also to a famine of faith. Because faith cometh by hearing. And if you're not hearing it, your faith is not growing. Which leads to a people who face the insurmountable, impossible task of attempting to please God without faith. We're never going to have a wordless church around here. We may stop the singing. We may stop the testimonies. We might even stop the offering someday. But we're not going to stop the Word. Notice the same messenger, Peter, desiring the same result, salvation. But they both got some work that needs to be done on them. I'm happy to tell you. I said, I am happy to tell you that the church has not arrived yet. There's still work to be done on us. That's why you cannot look down your nose at somebody who's barely starting out living for God. Because if the trumpet sounds, they may be more saved than we are. Look here, Jesus is dealing with Cornelius. And Cornelius responds obediently, quickly, promptly. But Peter, who represents the church, he has to repeat himself three times. Even though Cornelius knew how the Jews felt about him. Even though he had done many good acts for them. And Peter responded, The Holy Ghost. It's a perfect example of the continuing work of the Holy Ghost on an individual. You have got to continue to allow the Spirit of God to work on you. You have not arrived. The messengers end up staying the night and in the morning they arose and along with Peter and six other men, they traveled to Caesarea to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius, and I, I read this this morning and I couldn't help but get excited about it. But it's just a different world that we live in now. Different world. Cornelius, Brother Rice, he had done called all his kin people, all his friends, all his acquaintances. They had a house full of people waiting on Peter. And Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet. Now we often read that and we pass by it flippantly and, and disregard it. Especially since Peter very quickly stands him up. But it's understandable that Cornelius would fall down at Peter's feet considering the supernatural way they have been put together. It's a God thing that's taking place here. Let me tell you something. Add one caveat right in here. I would to God that we would wake up and realize that the hand of the Lord is on your life. Uh, if you have a flat, it may be because you need to witness to the one that's going to stop and help you. Uh, if you uh, if you lose your pocketbook, uh, it may be that you need to... we got to realize that the hand of the Lord is upon our life uh, in everything that we do. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. But I'm telling you, you got to stop looking at everything through a carnal perspective and begin to look at things in spiritual perspective. And i, I got to let you know something. It's the church that has a problem with that. It's not Cornelius, but it's Peter that has a problem with that. Cornelius, I feel the Holy Ghost just walked up in here right then. Cornelius has a desire to be pleasing to God in everything he does. And when the Lord says it, Cornelius does it. But God Almighty, think about this. God Almighty had to repeat himself. To the man of God. But Cornelius only has to be told once. Peter quickly grabs a hold of Cornelius and stands him up. And, and through this we can see the work of the Lord in Peter's life. Although the, the true revelation has yet to be revealed. you got to understand, Sister Maria, Peter still doesn't quite get it. He still doesn't quite get it. But we see the work of the Lord in Peter's life because he allows the Gentiles first to spend the night with him, stay under the same roof with him. He allows them to travel together. The fact that he even went, the Gentiles came to summon Peter and he went speaks of a change being taken place in him. And then he refused to allow Cornelius to lay down in front of him, but he stood him up and said, hey, I'm a man just like you are. Now look here, see if you see the irony in this. Verse number 28. 
Acts chapter 10 and 28. Let's see if you see the irony in this. The Lord has sent an, 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 a vision down from heaven. Said, what God's cleansed, don't you call common or unclean three times. And then, and then he says, there's three fellas tapping on your door right now. You go down and you go with them because I sent them to you. <laughs> 